start with examination of CNS, particularly we deal today. Uh, the topic is, is uh, the science of mental rotation and how we examine the to do examination of sensory system. Okay, so we start. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So basically, the overview of my presentation is today we uh, discuss with. What are the basic signs of mental irritation? What are the basic signs of mental irritation? Overview of that and how to assess the signs of mental irritation. Then we go for how to examine the sensory nervous system. Basically, for third year, third year, I only did with anatomy and dermatomes and examination, not the assessment. That is basically for the fourth year and final year. So we start. And what are the basic signs of mental signs of mental irritation? The term managerial managerism, this is basically the physical findings that are present of still any, any cause of managerial irritation. Whatever is the cause, that cause could be inflammation or the presence of any tumor or the presence of any hemorrhage or flood in the meningeal, in, the meninge, in between the meninges. That cause irritation of the meninges. That leads to some signs, physical signs. If inflammation or irritation of the meninges can, meninge, meninges can lead to increased resistance. Basically, what it causes, whenever there is irritation or inflammation of the meninges, there is increased resistance to passive flexion, passive flexion of the neck muscles and passive flexion of the neck. That's the, are the basic signs of uh, are present behind the signs of meningeal irritation. And absence of meningism never, but whenever there is, uh, you are expecting clinically that the child could have meningeal irritation or meningitis, but the signs of meningism are I was not there. But it totally do not uh, rule out that the child do not have uh, men uh, meningitis or bleed. You have to do the other examination also. Meningism always should always raise the possibility to raise the possibility of uh, presence of any infection or blood or any tumor within between the in the within the sub subarachnoid space or between the meninges. And there are basically uh, in physical examination we have to three basic signs of mental irritation. Nuclear rigidity, cunning signs, and Brudzinski signs. These are basically the three signs of mental irritation. Whenever you have already, um, in examination, you have to do what are the you have to do uh, perform what are the signs of mental irritation in this cell, you have to perform all these three signs. Nickel rigidity, you have to look for the nickel rigidity, you have to look for the cunning signs, or and also you have to look for the Brudzinski sign. So neck stiffness is basically caused by spasm of the muscles. And this spasm is secondary in the case of mental irritation. It is in case of meningi uh, meningitis or meningeal irritation due to any of the cause, it is due to the presence of this irritation that causes muscle uh, spasm that leads to muscle stiffness. So uh, stretching of the irritated distal spine, whenever there is also the uh, irritation of the distal spinal cord and nerve roots that produce the signs of Kerning signs and Brzezinski signs. Wherever, what, when the proximal spinal cord irritation, uh, meningeal irritation produce neck rigidity sign. So, uh, whenever you check for um, signs of meningeal irritation, you start basically we, we, most of the time we start with nickel uh, to check for nickel rigidity or increased neck stiffness. For that, first you have to make sure that there should be no cervical vertebra injury or cervical cord injury to that side. Uh, when and you then you keep the patient so in supine position. You uh, keep the patient in supine position without any pillow under the neck, and then place your hand behind the patient head. So the finger of your hand placed on the at the occiput like this. Exactly this. You put the patient in the supine position and. Place your hands behind the occiput, fingers over the occiput, and the index fingers in this thumb. It should be along the spinal, spinal muscles, like this. And then you try to flex the neck, but what actively you have to flex the neck passively. Ask the patient to try to flex the neck, or you can ask the patient to try to touch the chin towards the try to touch the chin with the chest. And if the patient is able to touch the chin with the uh, with the just easily then there is no nickel rigidity or no neck stiffness is present but if the patient is not able to perform this it say it it indicates that the child have positive nickel rigidity or positive neck stiffness so uh, you can put the patient supine place your hands behind the patient at with fingers of your hand at the occiput and ulnar border of your hands against the paraspinal muscle and then try to flex initially you have to flex in it passively do not try to flex the neck actively, okay? And 
how how much that until the chin touch the chest or you can ask the patient to try to touch your chin with the chest if the patient is able to do so then there is no nickel rigidity no neck stiffness but if the patient is very difficulty in touching the chin and there are signs of uh, facial expression as of pain that indicates that the child has nickel rigidity or neck stiffness positive then how you perform if this if stiffness is present then the neck cannot be passively move or normally the neck is supple and the patient can easily bend okay pain in the neck or resistance of you if, if you feel the resistance in your hands the muscles become becomes stiff it also indicates that the child have positive neck rigidity or positive neck stiffness sign okay and it it indicates what it indicates the presence of meningeal irritation whatever is the cause it is it could be inflammation it could be due to the presence of blood or present a tumor in the subarachnoid space or sometimes nickel rigidity or neck stiffness can also present in case of arthritis or if there is severe neck injury so you have to rule out the neck injury initially and in the in case of arthritis there is basically pain in the bone so it can neck neck stiffness not only present in inflammatory condition but neck stiffness can also pre present if the patient have arthritis of the cervical region so this is how you perform the neck rigidity then you have to check for brzezinski sign basically before going for the brzezinski sign i want to describe how to perform the kerning signs first kerning signs in case of to for assessment of the kerning signs you place the patient so in the supine position and then you hold the lack like this you uh, extend at in the uh, extend that limb at the hip joint and and sorry flex flexion of the hip 90 degree at the hip joint and also at the knee joint then you hold one uh, uh, with one hand you hold the foot and with the other hand you hold uh, you hold the hamstring muscles like this like, and then you try to extend the leg if the patient is uh, the the face of the expression of the facial expression of the patient showed severe pain it indicates that the child has child has positive kerning signs you hold the slack place the position patient supine then you hold the lag in the position that there is extension there is flexion of the hip joint 90 degree and flexion of the uh, knee joint at the also at the 90 degree then you hold the foot with one hand and place other hand at the hamstring muscles and then you try to extend the neck flex it's very slowly and if you feel the resistance in the hamstring muscles or there are there are the expression of pain on the face of the patient it indicates that the patient have positive kerning signs or the patient have muscle resistance so it indicates that the kerning sign is positive and the patient has uh, signs of meningeal irritation positive kerning sign is not present in local cause of neck stiffness like i previously said that whenever there is a spinal cord injury or arthritis there is neck pain but in that case neck pain is neck rigidity is there but kerning sign is negative in that case but if inflammation meningeal meningeal irritation is there then both the signs could should be present both signs should be present you like this you hold the uh, foot with one hand and other with at the hamstring or the back if you feel resistance of the muscles in your then your hand or this facial expression shows pain it indicate that the child have positive kerning signs okay and what about the brzezinski basically the brzezinski signs is not performed separately brzezinski ka aise beta ke when you perform the neck rigidity sign and kerning signs then brzezinski is passively performed simultaneously performed with that like when you try to flex in when you perform neck uh, nickel rigidity sign or neck rigidity when you flex the neck if with flexion you feel uh, resistance in your hand and also if the patient flex the both of the leg this flexion of both of the legs with with flexion of the neck indicates positive leg brzezinski brzezinski signs has two part leg brzezinski signs and the second is the neck brzezinski when you perform the nickel rigidity or neck rigidity sign if the legs are bent with flexion of the neck it indicates positive leg brzezinski and when you perform the kerning signs and along with the uh, when you perform the kerning signs with this leg extension the other legs also the other legs become flex when you perform the extension of the slack the other legs become flex that is the positive brzezinski signs or the patient flex the neck that is the neck brzezinski sign positive okay i repeat it 
Brzezinski is basically not performed separately. It performs simultaneously with the NAC rigidity design and Kerning's and Kerning's signs. When you perform NAC rigidity, if with flexion of the NAC, the child also flux with a flexion of the NAC that you feel a resistance of the muscles and the patient has difficulty. It shows pain on the face. The patient also flux both the NACs. That indicates a positive Brzezinski's NAC sign. Brzezinski's NAC sign and when you perform the kerning signs and, uh, and when you perform the kerning signs along with the pain you feel resistance in your hamstrings muscle over your hand the and, and facial expression of the face uh, on the patient face the patient also flux the other leg other leg also become flux that indicates positive brzezinski's leg sign positive so brzezinski has two part neck part and the leg part so these are the basic three signs of how you check the signs of meningeal irritation in a child. Neck rigidity, kerning signs, and Brzezinski's lag and Brzezinski's neck sign. So whenever you suspect meningeal meningitis or you feel that the child may have tumor or any any cause of meningeal irritation, these, these three signs may be present in that child. But always perform try to perform these signs specifically first particularly the neck sign. If the child try to flux the neck specifically first, if the child is able to flux the neck, then you try to perform this actively. Otherwise, the child may have, if the child has underlying spinal cord injury, that becomes more severe. That's why neck, uh, neck rigidity sign should be performed with passive flexion. Okay? Now, these are the three signs of meningeal irritation that usually we perform to check for meningitis, basically. Now, after these signs of meningeal, meningeal irritation, we go for how you examine for sensory nervous system. This is a very difficult system because it needs a full cooperation and coordination of the patient, active coordination of the patient. If the patient is fully unconscious or the patient is not cooperative, then it is very difficult to perform sensory system examination. Okay, so uh, basically first we, deal, we discuss the, what are the types of sensation. This sensory sensations are of two types, the primary sensations and the cortical sensations. Primary sensation, these include touch, pain, superficial and both deep pain, temperature, position, passive movements, vibrations, vibration senses. These are all the primary sensations. And what are the cortical sensations? These include localization, two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, estrogenosis, these are the cortical sensation. These are carried with the, directly deal with the, directly attached with the cortical system, cortex of the brain. And primary sensation that is start from the periphery, from the receptors. These are the primary sensation that include touch, pain, temperature, position, that are the common sensation. But cortical, there's, you have to assess for the cortical sensation also that includes two-point discrimination, localization, estrogenosis, and graphesthesia. And the sensations, basically primary sensations, these are carried by spinothalamic tract and dorsal column tract. Okay, spinothalamic tract and the dorsal column tract. Spinothalamic tract is pain, temperature, and crude touch, not the uh, not the uh, light touch. Crude touch, pain, and temperature. These are the sensation that is. These are carried by the small, slow conducting nerve fibers of the spinothalamic tract, and they travel basically from the periphery from the peripheral receptors, they enter the spinal cord and then cross to the other side of the cord and then travel, they cross within that level or two level above. And then, then they straightly go upward, continue up to the brain. Then they rely at the thalamus and from the thalamus, second order neuron carried up to the sensory cortex. This is basically the spinothalamic tract. Uh, spinothalamic tract, that start from the peripheral receptors. These are the receptors and these and the spinothalamic tract carry crude touch, pain, and temperature sensation. Start from the peripheral receptors, then the first order neuron nerves goes crosses the spinal root, and then it, it, uh, it crosses at the same level or one level above that, and it relies on the motor neuron in the uh, spine. Then the second order neuron that grows upward to the, to the brain and it relies on the thalamus. And thalamus that the producer. This is a second order neuron that from the thalamus, it goes, the nerve pathway goes up to the sensory cortex. This is the spinothalamic tract. As compared to the spinal thalamic tract, the other sensations like uh, 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 touch, 
light touch sensation, vibration, position sensors. These are carried by the dorsal column. Dorsal column pathway, and this starts from the peripheral receptors, pro prior receptors. Within this case, from that first order neuron, afferent nerves that goes through the palate, uh, that to, 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 to the same level of the spinal cord, but it does not cross to the upper side. It rely on the nucleus and the nerves that goes upward, and that on the same side of the track, and it cross towards the opposite side at the level of the basal or at the, at the level of the brain stem. It crosses to the opposite side, and from the opposite side, the fibers goes to the thalamus, and where it get relied. And from the thalamus, third, second order neurons get carried up to the primary sensory, somatosensory cortex. Okay, this is the difference. In case of spinal thalamic tract, the fibers cross at the same level, but in case of the dorsal column tract, the fibers cross at the level of the brain stem, not at the same level. So, dorsal column tract, uh, this. Position sounds, vibration sounds, and light touch. These are conveyed by the large fasting tract in the posterior or dorsal column. They travel from the periphery, entering the spinal cord, and then moving up to the base of the brain on the same side. Not do not cross at the level of the spinal cord. They cross at the level of the brain stem. Where they cross, and upon reaching the brain stem, they cross to the opposite side, terminating in the cerebral hemisphere. Before come terminating in the cerebral hemisphere, it terminated. It it rely at the level of the thalamus also, and then goes upward. To the on the cerebral hemisphere, so from above, at, they cross at the level of the brain stem, not at the level of the spinal cord. All the sensory fibers rely on the thalamus before sending information to the sensory cortex. So first of peripheral, uh, these are the sensory, primary sensory. These are not the cortical sensation. Cortical sensations are directly related with the cortex. Okay, this is the pathway of the primary sensation. That is the touch, pain, temperature, vibration, position sensors. These are carried from the peripheral receptors. Line the spinal cord, motor neuron, and then goes. In case of um, uh, uh, spinal thalamic tract, it goes. It cross at the same level. In case of the dorsal column, it goes directly upward and cross at the level of the brain stem. Then both of these fibers rely at the thalamus and finally at the sensory cortex. So this is the pathway. Spinal thalamic tract that carries the pain temperature, is pain, the crude touch, and temperature sensation, and the dorsal column tract that carry the vibration, position sense. Uh, light touch sensations okay this is and this is the sensory cortex basic the most of the part of the they foot fingers and uh, hand they carry the they occupy the large part they get kitna bada area hamare sensory cortex ka that cover it because it's needs very sensory very uh, light uh, movements or light sensations that's why they in ka area ye coverage bahut bada hai as compared to the whole of the face and trunk that is covered only by the this part two third part is covering the only the foot the hand that carries the small fine sensation sensory move sensations and the okay this is the sensory cortex use of a dermatomal and peripheral nerve map ha huh. before starting that yeah uh, how you as a sensation you have to know about the dermatomes okay because when you map out the dermatome then you can say get that which area of which part of the sensation which part of the cord is get uh, affected okay use of a dermatomal and peripheral nerve map can be help in localizing the sensory dysfunction which area is typically affected in both the limbs dermatomes basically uh, for the upper limb and lower limb you have to know okay, what are the dermatomal so dermatomal supply of the upper limb lower limb and the trunk for the upper limb the basically the back The occipital one and two, C one and C two do not have any sensory supply, but back occipital supply by C three and C four, collar by the C four, and then C five. This is the base of the neck, and at anteriorly from the base of the neck, at the level of the clavicle, the C five it supply the. This is the C five blue, and this is of C supply anteriorly. When you say then anteriorly, then it supplies the upper middle middle part of the upper arm. Up to the forearm. Do not supply the hand. Then C5 gives C6. C6 is there. Is there. C6 supply from just below the clavicular region, and it supplies the medial part. Your sorry, uh, lateral part of your whole hand, anteriorly and posteriorly. This up to the from up up to the tip of the shoulder, upper arm, arm, and the thumb. This is also um, anteriorly, both posteriorly. Thumb is supplied by C6. 
C7 basically, C7 is this. C7 is this pink. Interiorly, it C7 only supply the two fingers, index and middle finger. But at the back, it supply this all the part of a part of the upper part of the trunk, up, upper middle of the upper arm and middle of the lower arm as well as the two fingers. That was interiorly supplied by the C5. And C8, C8 basically supply the the medial part of the upper arm, middle upper arm, forearm, and these two little finger and the ring finger. This is supplied by the C8. Why T1? T1 basically supply the part of the trunk and upper part of the interiorly. Only interiorly T1 supply interior, upper arm and mid arm. You have to learn. You have to recognize these dermatomes. It is very important because if if the deltoid region is get affected or tip of the shoulder have no sensation, that in indicate your C6 get affected. If middle finger and uh, index finger do not have sensation, that in indicates what? Indicate C7 gets damaged. So, since the dermatomal recognition of dermatome is very, very important. You have to learn. You have to recognize it. Okay, what are the dermatomal supply of the upper limb, lower limb, and the trunk? And about the lower limb, this is uh, lower limb is basically supplied by the lumbar nerve and the sacral nerve. L1, L1 supply, you start from the from the lateral part, goes towards the medial part. Upper part, bilateral from the anterior superior layer of spine, from, anterior, from lateral to the medial part, the L1. Below that by the L2 and L3 basically supply a part of the from the lateral towards the, the medial side and also a part of the knee, skin that covers the knee. That is by the L3 and a part by and later from medial from lateral to medial. This major part is supplied by the L4. L4 also extending from this from thigh, knee part of the knee and this lag anteriorly anterior part of the lag up to the thumb, big toe, big toe, up to the big big toe supplied by L4. And knee supplies by the L3 and L4. L5 basically supplies the medial, medial part of leg, not the thigh. Up thigh include L1, L2, L3, and L4 from upward towards downward. L5 supply a medial part, a middle part of the leg is supplied by the L5 up to the middle three toes. These are supplied by the L5. S1 only supply the, the most lateral part and the little finger. And along the leg, little finger above leg is supplied by the S1. This is the S1. But at the back, the anterior part of the lag is supplied by the L1, L2, L3, L4 thighs and a part of the lag by L4. L4, L5 and a part of the S1 supply the lag anteriorly. Back, back is not supplied by, back is basically supplied by the S1, S2. Okay. And a part of the medial side of the lateral side is by the L, part by L4 and a part by the L3. L5 is only heel, heel. L5 supply the heel, L5 supplies the middle of the three toes. Little finger is supplied by S1 and a part of that leg from lower leg, thigh, back of the thigh, this is S1. Back of the thigh in the medial part, in the, the middle part and back of the leg of the middle part is supplied by the S2. So back of the leg is supplied basically overall is by S1 and S2. Anterior part of the thigh by L1, L2, L3 and L4, L4 up to the thumb, up to the big toe, sorry. And L5 is the limp supply, the little part of the anterior, but the back of the whole of the lag is supplied by basically by the S1, S2. A part of the heel is by L5. S1, S2, uh, sorry, S3, S4, and S5 supply the area around the gluteal region or the perianal region is supplied by the S2, S3, and S4. Okay, from medial to lateral side. S5, S4, and S3. Okay, this is the lower limb supply. And what about the trunk? Trunk accrued is that okay, T1 supply, T1 is a, just below the clavicle is supplied by the T1. Nipple, at the level of the nipple, nipple is supplied by, at the level of the nipple, skin is supplied by T4, anterior part of the trunk. T4, T4 supplied at the level of the nipple. ZV sternum, T7. Umbilicus, T10. And inguinal region is T12. Easy is that, at the level of the nipple, the dermatol supply is T4. Above that is from the clavicle, just below the clavicle T1 and T4 is at the level of the nipple. ZV sternum again, T7. A black cord, T10. And a guanyl region is T12. So you have to learn what is the dermatol supply of the trunk, upper limb and lower limb. Because if you remember this, you will know which dermatol supply, which part or exact which part of the sensory system get affected. Whether it affects the lumbar region, cervical region, of which cervical region S1, S7 is affected, S8 is affected, sorry, C8 is affected, C7 is affected. If the, the dermatological supply is affected of the 
and on the perineal region that indicates s1 and sorry s3 s4 and s5 get affected so when you know ki agar aapko pata hoga what is the dermal supply phir aap kaise ko ki this part of the typical part of the sensory system get affected so you have in sensory system you know what are the dermal supply of the trunk trunk limb and upper limb so a complete sensory system exam is possible the basic rule is that the child should whenever you have to do for perform the sensory system examination the patient should be conscious and cooperative otherwise it is not possible to perform sensory system examination you need the cooperation of a patient and conscious level of the patient to so properly expose the area where you have to examine explain the patient before performing any test explain it to the patient okay, i want to perform this way, this test i have to want to examine you like this अदरवाइज फिर वो बहुत एंशियस हो जाते हैं पेशेंट कि क्या आप नील पकड़ी तो वो बहुत परेशान हो जाएंगे कि क्या करें सो यू हैव टू एक्सप्लेन द टेस्ट बिफोर परफॉर्मिंग इट इन जनरल इट इज बेटर टू आज द पेशेंट टू लुक अवे अदर देन टू क्लोज द आई बिफोर बट इन सम केसेज यू हैव टू आज द पेशेंट टू क्लोज द आई एंड इन मोस्ट ऑफ द केसेज यू डू नॉट आज द पेशेंट टू क्लोज द आई ओनली सेट दैट लुक अवे फ्रॉम दैट रीजन ओके एंड द एक्सेप्शन ऑफ द टेस्ट ऑफ This is the position sense, cortical sensations. के लिए आपको you have to order that close eyes. Otherwise, apart from cortical sensation and joint position sensation, do not ask the patient to close eye. Always ask the patient to look away from that side where you perform the test. Okay. But in case of cortical, when you assess the cortical sensation and we check for the joint position sensation, then you ask the patient to look away from that side. Okay. And conduct sensory testing. Always test assess systematically. First. आप हिस्ट्री पूछ लें कि किच उनको कि कौन सा एरिया अफेक्टेड है हिस्ट्री में पता चल जाता है ना कि कौन सा पार्ट लोअर लेम अफेक्टेड है अपर लेम अफेक्टेड है तो जिस जो पार्ट अफेक्टेड होगा वहां से सेंसरी सिस्टम की एग्जामिनेशन स्टार्ट होगी ठीक है एंड टेस्ट अ पर्टिकुलर एरिया ऑफ द बॉडी एंड देन टेस्ट द कोरस्पोंडिंग ऑलवेज चेक द कोरस्पोंडिंग एरिया साइड बाय साइड पहले एक साइड देन द कोरस्पोंडिंग एरिया ऑफ द अदर साइड लाइक सेम व्हेन टेस्टिंग अ सेंसेशन कंपेयर बोथ द साइड्स एंड आल्सो द पेशेंट whether the sensations are equal on देखो सेंसेशन डिक्रीज भी होती है सेंसेशन एब्सेंट भी होती है और सेंसेशन इंक्रीज भी होती है हाइपर सेंसेशन हाइपोसेंस हाइपर हाइपरस्थीसिया हाइपरस्थीसिया एंड नॉर्मल एस्थीसिया ठीक है तो आपने पूछा कि इसके कंपैरिजन में ये बढ़ी है ये कम हुई है या नॉर्मल या सेंसेशन आपको यहां पे कम लग रही है या दूसरी तरफ कम लग रही है तो ऑलवेज आस्क व्हेदर द सेंसेशन आर इक्वल ऑन बोथ साइड और इट इज डिक्रीज ऑन वन साइड एंड इंक्रीज ऑन अदर साइड when mapping out an area of altered sensation move from reduced to higher sensitivity area so the, there may be loss of sensation anesthesia there may be decreased sensation aposthesia or there may be impaired or hyperesthesia or dysesthesia also so for say, when you start examination start with the touch sensation how you test check for the touch sensation test with the wisp of cotton like this you take a wisp of cotton and Touch at the sand. Likewise, the patient said that I have degree sensation or the senses uh, CNS is affected in the lower limb. Then you start from the foot. You check with this wisp of cotton. But when the they are they uh, they tell in the street that the sensation or or the CNS affected at the at the level of the upper limb. Then you just start from the upper limb. Okay, and you check the touch sensation with the wisp of cotton. You touch that only just touch, and then cross touch this corresponding area, and then touch and then ask the patient. You feel that or not? You feel that or not, or the sensation is decreasing. The sensations are equal in both sides, or it is decreased in one side or increased in another side. Okay, this is how you check the touch sensation. Touch with a wisp of cotton or fine soft paint brush. You basically we usually we use a cotton bud. Tightly to the skin, touch tightly to the skin, or mere touch of a tip of finger. The child being instructed to say yes or no immediately when feeling the touch sensation. Okay, so ask the patient to say yes if they feel the sensation. Say yes. Yes, he has both side. This should be repeated on the other side, corresponding same side. The patient should also mention if the sensation felt on the both side equally or the sensations are unequal. Okay, this is how you check the touch sensation. And for the superficial pain, sensation is two two, superficial pain and deep pain. For superficial pain, you assess with the fresh neurological pen. Do not use the hypodermic needle of the uh, syringe. Use the neurological pen. Dispose of the pen with each patient, and explain the patient before performing that. Explain the patient. I only touch it, touch this needle with your skin, and assess the how when whether you feel pain or not. Okay, 
reassure the patient explain and reassure the patient explain and demonstrate that the ability to feel a sharp prick is being tested and follow the testing points at dermatomal level and is always perform at the level of the dermatomal at the level of the c1 c2 level of the very uh, from the lower limb you have to check for the l4 l5 back for s1 and s2 take it and compare with the on the corresponding site and do not at at ask the patient to close the eye but you can say that look away from that side where you perform the test and map out the boundaries of area that have reduced or absent sensation and ask the patient when they feel pain say yes yes if they do not feel anything say no and then you test okay, test the area of the opposite corresponding side and ask the patient whether you feel the same pain of same intensity at both side or not okay and always follow the dermatomal area dermatomal supply for symmetry okay like this this upper dermal level in the lower limb you check at this point then corresponding opposite side then go upward then check at the level of this heel s5 um, l5 this area l5 this is l4 posteriorly by s2 one and s2 you have to know when you know the dermatomes then you can say that this is the area get affected okay this with hypodermal limb needle you check the touch fine pain sensation and crude pain or deep pain fine touch hota hai ek hota hai crude touch deep pain for fine pain and deep pain how you fine pain deep pain and fine touch sensation this is the, this is superficial pain deep pain and superficial touch this is carried by the spinothalamic tray so deep pain kaise check karenge explain that is when you skews the muscle belly like calf muscle bassus muscle belly tracer muscle belly or you can apply steep pressure toward the finger nail or the toe nail and and ask the patient whether they feel that pain or not or feel pain same of same intensity on both side or not Now, how you assess the deep pain? For deep pain, you have to excuse the muscle bundle. In the lower limb, you excuse the hamstring, uh, the hamstring muscle belly or calf muscle belly. Or in the upper limb, you can excuse at the level of the bicep or the level of the tricep. Okay, this is how you assess the deep pain. Or you can assess the deep pain by by putting pressure over the finger nails or toe nail bell, and then ask the patient whether they feel the, this deep pain or not, or they feel this deep pain equally on both side or not. Okay, this is very important that they feel pain equally on both side. Sometimes there is pain on one side, but there is more hyperesthetic pain on the other side. So abnormal side is hyperesthetic. and then for temperature deep in but temperature temperature how you assess the temperature usually we assess the temperature with the metallic object like with the stethoscope back metallic part of the stethoscope you put the metallic metallic part of the stethoscope is uh, stethoscope at the side and we and ask the patient whether they feel cold of course metallic is temperature is less than the, than the other wood instrument or thing so you can use the metallic object or ideally you have to take the test you one with cold water and one with hot water then you put then you apply this metallic object or this test tube over the skin first you check for the upper limb then the lower limb it depend which part of the body get affected start with that part that is affected okay and you assess the temperature sensation like this or you apply the metallic part of your stethoscope from the distal part and going to the proximal this is how you take the assess the temperature sensation now for the dorsal root tract for vibration sensation for vibration vibration sensation you have uh, you can use what for vibration you have a tuning fork 128 hertz tuning fork first you ask the patient uh, you vibrate the tuning fork and apply over any part of the so towards the sternum and ask the patient whether they feel this buzzing or not then you put when you if you assess for the lower limb apply this tuning fork tip towards the at the big toe then you have to apply this tuning fork at the bony prominence in the lower limb you have to apply that the tip of the big toe you have to apply that uh, towards the ankle uh, medial tuberosity lateral tuberosity or at the tibia or at the knee you have to apply this tuning fork over the bony prominence and uh, ask the patient whether they feel this buzzing sensation or not okay so next play is the tip of the great toe if sensation is impaired yeah, over the big toe then you place the 
work on the interphalangeal joint goes proximally from the distal to the proximal. When the lower in the low in the upper limb, you start from the interphalangeal joint, then put the uh, your tuning fork over the radial steroid process, then the olecranon process, then the acromion process. So it goes from distal to the proximal side for the low upper limb. And for, as, same for the lower limb. Start at from the big toe, then the lateral medium areolus, then the tibia, or at the distal tuberosity of the uh, tubal tuberosity or at the anterior superior iliac spine point. If, and then ask the patient, they feel the sensation or not. If there is doubt to the accuracy of the response, ask the patient to close the eyes and report when the vibration of the tuning fork gets fit. To when, whether they feel the buzzing sensation or the other, if you have um, any doubt, then ask the patient when to uh, close, ask the patient to close the eye and report you when they stop feeling the vibrating sensation. And then like you uh, put the vibrating tuning fork at the, at the big toe and ask the patient to close the eye and report you when he stops feeling vibrating sensation. And then you match it with, your, with yours. You put same time this vibrating tuning fork touch your hand. If you feel the vibration, but patient said that he is not able to uh, feel the vibration, it indicates that the, the vibration sensation, he can feel the vibrating sensation, but these are decreasing as compared to yours. Yours is normal. Okay. So first you can place the tuning fork and ask the patient whether they feel these vibrations and then ask the patient to close the eye and report you when they stop feeling vibrating sensation. And always start from the distal part and go towards proximally and put the tuning fork at the bony prominent side. This is like this. Put the tuning fork over here, over here, then at the tibia, tuberosity over there, over the uh, bony part of the uh, skin, subcutaneous part of the tibia. Okay? You can also compare the patient's response to yourselves. This is how you take, you tear, assess the vibration sensation. Then joint position sensation, how you assess the joint position sensation. Uh, for the lower limb, you can hold like this. Like keep the patient in the supine position and then first you explain the patient that I hold this to so your thumb, big toe and I try to flex the toe and then extend it. You have to sit and you, you have to close that because always perform joint position sensation, assess the joint position sensation with the close eye. And first explain the patient that I am doing this, I will flex it and then extend it. You have to close your eyes and when you close your eyes, अगर अब मैं पूछूं तो आपने बताना है कि नीचे किया है या ऊपर किया है ठीक है ताकि लेकिन ये ये जॉइंट पोजीशन सेंसेशन ऑलवेज ऑलवेज एसेट विद क्लोज विद क्लोजिंग आई ओके विद द पेशेंट आई ओपन आईज डेमोंस्ट्रेट दैट एंड होल्ड द डिसल फैलेंस ऑफ द पेशेंट ऑफ द सो एट द साइड टू अवॉइड एनी इंफॉर्मेशन फ्रॉम द पेशेंट मूव इट अप एंड डाउन एंड आस्क द पेशेंट टू क्लोज द आई एंड देन टेल आस्क द पेशेंट टू रिस्पॉन्ड विद अप down, up, down. Very move the toe randomly. Sometimes up or down. If the patient, without uh, you make the movements without him or her assessing or resisting. Now ask the patient to close his or eye and, and to identify the direction in a random sequence. Okay? Whether it goes up or down or towards the right side or towards the left side. If patient say up, with the up, down. Okay? So you can assess with close eye whether the patient can assess the position sensation or not. Test both the big toe or you can assess with the middle finger or in the upper limb. Upper limb you can uh, test it with the with the thumb or with the middle finger. Move it in up and down position and ask the patient uh, whether the patient move up or down with close eye. Okay, this is how you assess the position sensation. Okay, you hold this big toe and move up and down and ask the patient to close the eye and assess whether the thumb is moving up or down. Okay. And this is the Romberg sign. This is also for the position senses. This is not for, this is for the, this is not for the cerebral part. This Romberg sign or this, ask the patient, this is for the sensory part of the balance. Ask the patient to stand with his feet by side and having balance, established balance is satisfactory with open eye. But if the patient tried to, uh, if the patient becomes imbalanced or loses balance with closed eye, it indicates that the sensory part of the Romberg sign is positive. That is your Romberg sign. It, it, you stand the patient with open eye and the patient is, but if the patient is not make balance with the open eye, that indicates that the cerebellar area is affected. But patient 
is making establish the uh, balance satisfactory with open eye but when you ask the patient to close the eye the patient balance get disturbed or the patient try to fall f f backward it indicates that the sensory part of the balance get affected that is the rhombic sinus positive like this you hold the patient and make the balance but if the patient is not able to make the balance with the open eye there, there is no need to perform the rhombic sign but if the patient make the balance with the open eye but and then you try to ask the patient to close the eye but with the close eye the patient is not able to maintain the balance it indicates the patient rhombic sign is positive and the patient has sensory ataxia not cerebellar sensory ataxia that is rhombic sign positive and they indicate sensory ataxia that is a spinothalamic tract or sorry posterior dorsal column is affected because of the loss of position sense this is the rhomboid now you how you check for the uh, cortical sensations Quanti cortical sensations cortical sensation clearly you have to ensure show make sure that the patient should be mentally alert having the normal speech and that their primary sensations are intact if primary sensation pain touch and temperature of abhishek get affected then you cannot perform the cortical sensation cortical sensations ke liye zaruri rule hai ki primary sensation should be intact patients should be mentally in alert cooperative and have normal speech so that patient scan so that the patient can perform how you want to perform it okay coordinate fully coordinate patient cooperative patient should have a speech so patient can Uh, performed that uh, maneuver and primary sensation should be intact if primary sensations are not intact then you cannot perform cortical sensations cortical sensations include two point discrimination localization graphesthesia and stereogenesis for two point discrimination you can use the two blunt pen or two blunt instrument like an instrument like a pair of blunt tipped school campers or open two paper clips okay ask the patient to look away not closer sometimes to close close basically closure of the eye for for the uh, position sensation ask the patient to look away or close the eye and then apply these two two points of the blunt at the first at the, the when you check for the upper limb look, put at the over the pulp of the finger okay no, basically and adjust the distance first increase and then try to decrease that different of the uh, distance of the two points But normally at the pulp of the finger you you uh, find that uh, distance of these two pins or two pricking points is of 2 mm you can normally feel it but when the distance of these two is of 1 mm you cannot to discriminate the two points but if the patient a uh, discriminate is up to the level of the five let's say at the when you you place two points at the pulp of the finger and the patient is not able to discriminate do these the two points at the distance of between 3 or 4 mm then it means that the patient two point discrimination is get affected the patient only feel two point discrimination at the at 100 at 50 mm or 10 mm it, uh, but do not feel two point discrimination at 3 mm or 2 mm it indicates that the patient two point discrimination is affected but in the lower limb this two point discrimination is up to the level of 100 mm if the patient feels two point discrimination in the ladder at the lag at 100 mm it indicates it's normal but he is not able to discriminate the two point at the level of 100 mm or 110 mm or 120 mm it indicates that the two point discrimination is affected because less than 100 mm the two point normally is not discriminated Okay, with the upper limb, it is up to the level of the two millimeter or five or two to five, and the lower limb hundred millimeter. If this distance is more than five millimeter on the pulp of the finger, it indicates abnormal. If it is more than one twenty millimeter in the lower limb, it is abnormal two point discrimination. Okay, this is how you check the two point, two compass, or you can take the two paper clips with the pulp of the finger. This one, in you start with the more distance. Let's say start with ten millimeter. Then decrease the distance ten, nine, eight, up to five millimeter or two millimeter is normal. But if the patient do not discriminate up to, of more five or more, it indicates that a two point discrimination is affected. Okay. Now point location. When the patient eye close, slightly touch various parts of the body at the hand or the finger, shoulder, and randomly, and whether and ask the patient. and part has been touched and whether on the right or the ask the patient whether you touch which part of the body and right or and which right or left part of the body and which part and repeat this touching individual fingers asking the patient to identify which patient you get touched inability 
to find that which fingers get uh, touched or which part of the body get touched. Patient, patient cannot recognize that which part is get. Patient feels the sensation of touching, but do not localize that which part you touched. It indicates that the point location is affected. There is a cortical point location sensation is affected in that patient. Likewise, stereogenesis and graphesthesia. For stereogenesis, we usually use like this. To close the eye and place familiar objects, small objects like coin, key, matches stick in the patient hand and ask the patient to identify that object. If the patient is able to identify that this is the key, that is the coin, that is the patient has normal stereogenesis. But if the patient only feel the object but do not recognize it, okay, whether this is a round object, that this is a ball or this could be the key, then that the patient has stereogenesis, stereogenesis, okay? Like blunt pencils are or graphesthesia for graphesthesia you use the blunt angle and end of the pencil and make the letter draw the letter that e a and if the patient recognize that you write down that letter or write make a circle or a triangle patient recognize it that the patient has normal cortical sensation but if the normal graph, graphic sensation but if the patient is not able to recognize that letter or that shape that indicates that the patient has graphesthesia okay how this is how you assess for stereogenesis and graphesthesia. Okay, sensory inattention. Ask the patient to close the eye and touch the back of each patient hand and turn and ask the patient which part is get touched. This is the sensory inattention. Achha, assessment ki aapko third year is no need. For third year, it is important that sensory sensation mein kya -kya dekhna aapne? basically you have to know the dermatomes of the patient. Okay, what are the dermatomes supply of the body? And then start sensation from the primary sensation. Primary sensation include touch, pain, temperature, crude touch, deep, uh, deep pain sensation, superficial pain sensation, temperature, and for the dorsal tract, vibration, position sensation. Okay, and light touch. Light touch with the cotton wool and deep, and deep touch with the Excusing of the muscle belly. And for the temperature, we use the test tube or with the metallic object. For vibration chance, we use the um, cheering fork. And for position sense, we make different positions randomly of a part of the body. And then if the, if the primary sensations are intact, then go for the cortical sensation. That including the two-point discrimination, localization, graphesthesia, and stereogenesis. This is basically the whole sensory system. You have to assess in a in any child during your sensory system examination. That is an okay. Any question? Yeah, madam, end kare sir. Yes, ha. Koi question hai to bata de, banana. No, madam, question to koi nahi. ठीक है ओके